wings and fly. Let's fly with eagles' wings. Take eagles' wings and soar into the supernatural things. Above the clapping of the hands, above the joy of the saints. Take eagles' wings and soar above the realm of earthly Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank God there's something inside. Amen. Something that's pulling us. Amen. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless our brothers and sisters richly. Amen. Let's stand to our feet now. Amen. As we invite our brother forward. Amen. I'm free, so free, for I'm in the Spirit. The Spirit's in me. Hallelujah. wonderful to be free amen and in his word that is where we are free amen you know I was just listening this morning and uh, one thing God doesn't like a lazy Christian he wants us to do something for him amen and God bless you for coming to his house this morning we have dressed we come here to worship him to give him praise and honor and I want to thank our young people that sang the song you know it takes some dedication and courage to do that and it's good to be busy with the things of God amen read your Bible listen to the message sing songs unto him God does not like a lazy Christian amen this morning I have some people that we just want to also welcome in our midst here's a message here for a brother and Paul and a sister precious may you uh, feel free this morning and happy to be in the house of God also, we want to welcome our brother Samuel and family visiting with us. And I also see brother Tristan and sister Estelia. Uh, they have been residing in New Zealand for a while, but it's good to see them back here. And uh, we, we will most likely see a bit more of them as well. So, anybody else that is visiting here for the first time or 
you just, you just feel welcome in the house of God this morning. And, you know, you will get what you came to expect. And it's not, I prayed with my brother in the back here, and I know there's a lot of pressure on him. You know, but when you come and stand here and the Holy Ghost takes over, that is when God just starts to deal with us. And He speaks to you in such a personal way, and that's what we have come here for this morning. So may the Lord be in all of this. I also want to welcome here uh, Mr. Pumalela. Uh, he is uh, he's just asking for some comfort. May the Lord grant him that comfort. He's visiting with a brother here this morning. So may the Lord also bless you this morning. Let's sing that again this morning. I'm free as we hand over to our brother Madiba. And I just want to say, brother, you're a familiar face. Welcome here. You take your time. We are all really in expectation. Amen. greet all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many in the building can say, indeed, I'm free. Uh, And we are free from the bondage of sin. And I believe that in no time we'll be in another dimension. How many still expect the rapture? It is the only hope for this generation. No matter what the devil does, never miss that rapture. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Brother Danny, for a warm introduction. Let's just get into reading the word. Let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. The brothers have fleshed to my title of my sermon this morning. It's forgiveness in the neuritic age is what I want to speak about. How many agree that we live during a neuritic age? There's so much pressure in our time. We are caught up in a red race. There's so, so much happening but I want to look at the subject of forgiveness in this age. Ephesians 4, 32, I'm going to read, and then you read after me. Be ye kind one to another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Colossians, the third chapter, verse 13. If you have found it, you may say amen. Amen. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye, as we bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, one day you took a body of flesh and went all the way to Calvary, and died between the heavens and the earth. And your last words was that it is finished. The sin question was settled. Men and women were forgiven. This morning we are coming here, dear God, for a fellowship. 
and we've got nothing else to fellowship around except the word. Especially in our time, there is nothing that can defeat Satan except the word. We have tried the denominationalism, it failed. We tried education, it failed. We tried so many things, all of them have failed. But the message of the hour is succeeding in defeating Satan. As I stand behind the holy desk, dear God, shut down my thoughts. May it be your thoughts. May it be your word. That when we come to the end of the service, we all should glorify God. As I commit the reading of the word to you, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. God bless you richly as you take your seats. Normally, whenever a minister comes with a subject, sometimes it's good to tell the people how you were inspired to find the subject that you would want to speak on. I had a, a lad that came into my office, must be around, if I'm not mistaken, around nine or ten years. And he stepped into my office and said, look, I do have a question for you, Pastor. I say, uh, young man, shoot. He said, between being forgiven and forgiving, which one is the greatest? And I realized right there that the answer was not as simple as you'd think. And I said, young man, look, I need to apply my mind. I'll revert to you as to which is the greatest. And I've even gone back to him. This sermon will answer him. Amen. Now, the reason I said it was not easy, uh, I think one might have maybe opted to say, look, to forgive is the greatest, or to be forgiven is the greatest. But later on, when I applied my mind and looked into the scriptures, I realized that the two are interconnected. I realized that you can't have one without the other. I realized that it takes the one that is forgiven to understand what it means to forgive. Are you with me this morning? How many people have been forgiven in the building? Uh, we were all sinners saved by grace. We did not come here as angels. We were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. And we did a lot of things that God would, not be, would have not been pleased with us. But at some point in time, his grace was sufficient. And this morning we stand his, in his presence and we say, we are forgiven. But now, the question would be, can you forgive? And I was thinking, what would the world be without forgiveness? I don't think marriages will last without forgiveness. I don't think nations would last without forgiveness. And a lot of chaos that you see in the end time is because of lack of forgiveness. The ability to say, I forgive. Now, forgiveness, it means to seize, to feel resentment against the offender. There are people that think that forgiveness has more to do with the offender and less to do with them. But I beg to differ. Forgiveness is the gift that you give to yourself to forgive a person that has wronged you. Amen. And I believe all of us, at some point in time, we were wronged. Amen. Am I correct? Amen. And at some point in time, I had much better take it further, we wronged others. Yes. Uh, is, is that the case? Yes. And at some point in time, we had to forgive, and at some point in time, we had to be forgiven. So let me just paint a picture of the age in which we are living in, Brother Brenham says in the message, Letting of the Pressure, paragraph 35, he says we are living in a neurotic age, and I'm going to come back on what it means to be in a neurotic age. He carries on, he says, nervous tension. Everybody is racing here and going there and going nowhere. Everybody is going so fast, but no one is going nowhere. And he says it's just to that kind of an age 
And he says, I know this church would be plagued by, with it, as everywhere is plagued with it. Tabernacle is plagued with it everywhere, the whole world. Even now, as I'm sitting here, most of you are under pressure. We all are chasing deadlines at work. We all, I mean, to a point where you feel like 24 hours is no longer enough. You think like the day could be extended because of how the society has come under so much pressure. And during the week, it never happens where somebody doesn't cut in front of you as you are driving. It's the age in which we are living in. You find somebody is racing down the, the, the road and you follow them only to find when they park, the, the, they're not in, in a hurry of anything. They were just racing down the road. It's because of the pressure of the time. Are you still with me? And Brother Branham says, the tabernacle, referring to Branham Tabernacle in this instance, he says it was not immune from it. And I would like to believe that even this church is not immune from it. And I would like to say families in this church are not immune from it. And Brother Danny, as ministers, we are not immune from it. But uh, I think when we live in a neurotic age, we cannot react the way the world reacts. Hallelujah. Our coping mechanism is not the same. Yeah. Uh, I think we've got better coping mechanism than the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, how many agree? And we are going to get into the coping mechanism. Yeah. Now, he carries on because I just want to build uh, a background to, uh, to that. He says, it's just a build of pressure. It's the age that we are living in, a neurotic age where people don't know what to do where they are going and the doctors don't have the answer for it because the psychiatrist is being doctors doctored by the psychiatrist that means your therapist needs a therapy as well your psychologist has got a psychologist your doctor has got a doctor but uh, let me tell you something in the midst of this there is the great physician and he says, I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee of all thy diseases. Amen. He's a healer even this morning. Amen. And I, I think you came into the presence of God and you've got an expectation. And you know, the beauty about being in the presence of God is that God can do a diagnosis. And he can even administer Q in real time. Amen. And God has never done a misdiagnosis. His diagnosis is always correct. And how many of us, I, I believe most of the time I say, Lord, I know you have healed me even from the sicknesses that I'm not aware of. Because when I'm in your presence, you make the diagnosis. And through the preaching of the word, you administer the healing. Amen. Let's carry on. Ne neuroticism is defined as a tendency to experience anxiety. Uh, even our young people are anxious. Even married people are anxious. Breadwinners are anxious. Wherever you go, anxiety levels have skyrocketed. And I'd much better tell you, there's never been any, any society in history that has, that has been as medicated as this society. Pharmaceutical companies are making a fortune because of the state of minds of the people. Are you still with me? But uh, I, I, and I say, there is nothing wrong with getting medication. Brother Brown says, we thank God for good doctors. But again, remember, what, what, what I have picked up in our time is that everything, if you come up with a solution that is not weight-based, it creates a new problem. It always creates a vicious cycle. You go to a doctor for diabetes, he gives you this medication, and in no time, the medication causes other complications. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? But once God gives you a remedy, there's never complications. Once you find a solution that is weight-based, it never gives any complications. And folks, the, the word of God will defeat Satan anywhere, anytime, and under any conditions. And the best place to be in our time, be in an area that is fortified by the word of God. Amen. I hope we are together. Now, it's defined by a tendency to experience anxiety, depression, 
Depression is real during our time. Young people are battling with depression. Are you still with me? And that is why I, I always say it is very critical. It's not nice to have. It's very critical to have a family altar. Because around the family altar, that's where you pray for one another. Around the family altar, that's where you check on one another. How many times where a young person has committed suicide and the family say, we had no idea what they were going through. What's happening? They are staying in the same house and they've become strangers. So it is absolutely critical that we must have family prayer. And I always say, if you don't have it at home, don't expect it in church. If you don't have prayer at home, don't expect prayer in church. If you don't have miracle at home, don't expect miracle in church. It all begins at home. Are you still with me? I hear a lot of people speak about the third pool ministry. I think when we saw the third pool ministry, we saw it in a family environment. Where Brother Brenham knelt down and said, God, this has been a good woman. She's got tumor. She has never disappointed me. She has always ironed my clothes. She has never even complained one bit. When you hear what the prophet says in that message, the unfolding, unfailing promises of God, you get a sense that Brother Brenham was making it an obligation for God to heal Sister Mida on the basis of her character. I said, until God came to a point and said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not the one that will speak her healing. You stand up and speak her healing. And Brother Ronam stood up and said, before the doctor's hand touches her, may she be, she be whole. Yeah. Are you still with me? And I say, may we be people of such character. Where I, 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 brother, I want, your wife has got to be the kind of wife that you can go before God and persuade God on the basis of her character and say, look what she has done. Look who she is. What she has done to the children. Her dedication. Hallelujah. And in the same thing, brothers, may we be the kind of husbands that our wives will be able to present us before God and say, this is my husband. Look what he has done. Look how he cares about your things. And God will step in. We need God in our homes. I say we need God in our homes. We need a healer in our homes. Because the devil has gone on a rampage. The devil would want to destroy. That's, that's his purpose. He, he, he specializes in destruction. And I believe you and I, we were ordained for this season to stop him in his tracks. If he wants to destroy, we build. I hope we are together. Let me get into a few things. And sorry if it sounds a bit academic for two slides. I'm going to go back into... Uh, the, the, the quotations. I made an observation, a statement was said by a certain doctor, Dr. Stephen Studyfort. He's the chief of surgery at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. He made this profound statement. Unforgiveness is now classified in medical books as a disease. When you don't forgive, you are sick. You need a divine healer. Are you here this morning? Now, let me carry on with what he says. And I'm going to tie it up with what the prophet says because most of the time the prophet saw these things before these people could see them. According to Dr. Stephen Studyford, refusing to forgive makes people sick and keeps them that way. With that in mind, forgiveness therapy is now being used to help treat diseases such as cancer. They can't recommend forgiveness unless they've made an observation of cancer patients. They made a study and 61% of cancer patients were found to be struggling with forgiving someone. Isn't it amazing that you can spend millions and uh, thousands and thousands of rands on your medical aid only to find that actually your answer is not with the pharmaceutical company, but your answer is just lying with to say, 
Lord, I forgive him. Amen. Lord, I forgive him. Now, here is a question. Sometimes you've got to forgive even when they don't ask for forgiveness. Because forgiveness is a gift that you give unto yourself. It does not exonerate the perpetrator, but it sets the victim free. Because why? If you don't let go of that resentment, you are tied to that offender for the rest of your life. I made an observation, and I was, I was very curious, because uh, from, I think it was from April 1994 until May 1994, over one million Rwandese perished in genocide. And I wonder, I say, how did the people that survived the genocide cope? And I followed up most of their stories, and I realized because genocide can be tragic. Parents lose children, children lose parents. It's chaotic. And I realized most of the survivors, they say, in order for us to carry on with our lives, we had to forgive. Are you still with me? But it does not, it does not exonerate the perpetrator. But they realize we can't carry on with our lives unless we're able to forgive. Folks, how many marriages have been destroyed because of the inability to forgive? Brother Branham speaks about it in the message a paradox. He speaks about a young boy. This boy was baptized. This boy was a member at Branham Tabernacle. And Brother Branham says, and this boy wanted to get married. And Brother Branham discouraged the boy to get married. He says, because when I look at the boy, the, there are strong genes from his mother's side, and there are strong genes from his uh, father's side, and the father's side, they are indifferent, and the mother's side as well, they cannot forgive. And Brother Warren said, if he ever marries a woman, he will create hell here on earth for this woman. Because why? He's not able to say, I'm sorry. And maybe I'd much better take it on your doorstep. I never thought, even in the message, would come across individuals that lacks the ability to say, I'm sorry. And let me tell you something, a position does not immunize you from saying, I'm sorry. I've been a pastor for a number of years, but what I've mastered, I say, Lord, no matter my position, if I've wronged somebody, I must be able to swallow my pride and say, I'm sorry. Amen. Are you still with me here, folks? Let's carry on, because I've spoken about too much of academic statements. Let me come to Malachi 4. The infallibility of God's spoken word. Paragraph 4. The prophet says, you know, I was telling the boys a while ago coming over, I said about how we must be happy all the time. The devil wants to steal your joy. And most of you still have salvation, but the devil has stolen your joy. And I think this morning we had much better say, God, restore the joy of my salvation. There is nothing, there is no feeling that is worth for you to lose the joy of your salvation. Because if you lose the joy of your salvation, you are not going to be able to praise God. And folks, we had much better praise God. He created us to worship him. He created us to praise him. He can't praise himself. We must praise him. We must usher all the praises upon him. He deserves all the praises. And I say, devil, no matter what you do, you are not going to stop me worshiping God. The prophet says we must be happy all the time. God don't want you to be sad. You know what ill temper does? That old temper, that's one of the awful old things. It's about 60% of the cause of all sickness is temper. Now, I was reading for, for you what uh, that other doctor was saying, but now I'm reading to you from what the doctor that God sent in the end time called Malachi 4 is saying. He's telling you statistically 60% of cases of diseases is as a result of temper. What is temper? It's rage. What is rage? It's an ill feeling towards somebody. And if you take it further, it's the inability to forgive. He says, yes, sir. Ten trumps, you fly loose. Remember, you are just developing cancer. Ulcer. 
or something like that when you do it. When you get all stood up about somebody, I won't go back there anymore. Wait till I give them a piece of my mind. All right. Remember, you are the one who's going to pay for it. Do you see sometimes when you hold on to resentment, when you hold on to unforgiving spirit, and you think you are doing the other guy an injustice, you are destroying yourself. And, 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 you, and you are imprisoning yourself. But this morning, we want to break down the prison walls. Yeah. Where you are able to raise your hands. And say, no matter, even if they say, they never said I'm sorry, but I forgive them. Yeah. It's not about them, it's about who I am. Yeah. It's not about what they've done, it's about who I want to be. Now, let me come, because I want to follow up on the issue of what causes sicknesses. Maybe this sermon is for somebody. Maybe I'm led to say this, maybe it's just for one person. And if God saves one person, so be it. Now, when, when you are unforgiving and you hold resentment, and you, you've got this rage that has built up in you, it triggers, it, it makes your uh, cortisol levels high. When you are stressed, it's, your, it's, your, it's a hormone. Cortisol, the levels are rising. Now, I want to show you what it does. When they take maybe an organ, maybe harvest an organ from somebody that is deceased, and they donate it to the new person, the doctors, what normally they would do, they would shoot the recipient of a new organ with cortisol because it has to suppress the immune system. Because if the immune system is not suppressed and you give a new patient an organ, the, the immune system is going to attack the new organ because it doesn't recognize it. Now, what I'm, I'm not here for medical term. I'm simply saying when you are stressed, when you are pressurized, your cortisol levels are rising, your immune system is suppressed, and that's where the sicknesses are able to attack you. That's why it's good to, to have quiet time. The best thing that you can do is meditation. It does wonders to you. It, it rebuilds your system both naturally and spiritually. When you lay in the presence of God and maybe just play a soft music and meditate about the goodness of God, it will do wonders on you. Because our generation does not have the ability to pause. It's about what must I do next. But we are going faster to the grave. And let me say this. You cannot save the whole world. You can pray for them but you can't save the whole world. Sometimes certain things that you cannot control, leave it to God. And say, God, I'm not in control of this situation, but I'm committing it to you. But here is the problem. In our time, everybody wants to control. Everybody wants to say, I want it to go my way. I want it to be this way. But let me tell you, let it go God's way. And our will is not going to supersede God's will. We must have the ability to accept God's will. Yeah. Let me give an illustration. Do you know that even you are being here, you never planned being here? Yeah. Even the family that you were born in, you never planned to be in that family. Amen. The color of your skin, you never chose the color of your skin. You just woke up and found yourself in this way. Some great intelligence chose for you to be who you are. Why don't you trust the same intelligence throughout the rest of your life and say, Lord, as long as you are in control. Amen. Mark 11, verse 25, let's read it. I read you read after me. When he stand praying, forgive. If he ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven 
may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now Jesus is telling you, sometimes an obstacle between you and God and you and, your, and what hinders your prayers sometimes is you don't forgive. Forgiveness unlocks the channel. But an unforgiving spirit clocks it up. Are you still with me? Now, in the message adoption, the prophet says, paragraph 24, but the thing I want to try to get to you is this, that a man that is in Christ with the Holy Ghost can bear with a man when he's wrong. And I'm sharing these chips with you over the period of time. I've always had the desire that no matter what, I would never want to have any feeling towards anybody. It doesn't mean I will agree with everybody, but I don't want to have any feelings towards anybody. And I made an obligation that uh, over the present of time, if I see that I develop an ill feeling towards somebody, it's time for me to pay them a visit and have coffee with them and just, just show my love to them. Let me, it's not easy, folks. Because why? You've got to conquer yourself. You've got to conquer your emotions. And sometimes you have been wrong, rightly so, and you know I've been wrong. But sometimes you must have the ability to rise above your feelings. Yeah. Well, how would have got it if, if, you, if you wronged God? And God felt very, 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 he didn't feel good about what you did. And, 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 and he looked at you and, and, and he couldn't forgive you. It would have been terrible. But God doesn't care. Every time he's willing to forgive us. Even though, look, Jesus is dying on the cross. You, you know how painful it was. A lot of people think that he, he died because of the uh, nail wounds. No, sir. The reason they nailed him on the cross is because they wanted them to die by suffocation. Here is a man, he's nailed on the cross. And you know, if, for you to breathe on the cross, because for you to inhale, that means he had to lift up his body. You know how painful it was. For him to exhale, he had to let go of his way. He had to alternate in that manner, in that painful environment. And he was subjected by humanity. But while he was in that condition, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Amen. And I tell you, brother, if you are his seed, you will do exactly the same thing. Are you still with me, folks? Brahman says, he can bear with a man when he is wrong. Somebody came to me and said, you know, it was in the assembly, so-and-so stepped onto my toes. I said, can't we just thank God that you've got toes? Other people don't have toes. <laughs> now, it changes your perspective. Isn't so, folks? He says he can bear with a man when he's wrong. Long-suffering, gentle, patient. He's sweet, humble, faithful, filled with the Spirit, never negative, always positive. He's a different person. Yeah. I was telling my assembly, I say. What we need in the message today are bridge builders. There is scarcity of bridge builders. What does it mean to be a bridge builder? If I've got access to Brother Danny, and I've got access to Brother Robert, and they don't agree, and I go to Brother Danny and say, Brother Danny, you do not know what Brother Robert said about you. He said this, this, and I mentioned the best stuff. I am making Brother Robert's feelings towards Brother, uh, Brother Danny's feelings towards Brother Robert hardened. And I go to, because when he is angry, he's going to say certain things. And I'm going to take that and say, Brother Robert, you don't know what Brother Danny said about you. This is what he said about you. Then again, Brother Robert's feelings towards Brother Danny are hardened. But if I become wise, and I go to Brother 
Danny, and he, he's upset with Brother Robert, and say, you know, this brother, this and that. And I say, hang on, you know I was with Brother Robert. He told me that, look, him as much as you disagree, but you are a good man. He tells me that he believes that when you pray, God hears your prayer. He says, you are an honest man. Now, after that, Brother Danny is going to light up and say, did he really say that about me? He will say, hang on, I know I disagree with the brother, but you know one thing about Brother Robert. He would never be late for appointment. He will always be on time, he's punctual. Then I take that to Brother Robert and say, Brother Robert, you don't know, Brother Danny says he has met a lot of people, but no one is as punctual as you are. What is happening? I'm becoming a bridge builder. And I say today, the message of the hour, community, needs bridge builders. And here is my question that I can drop on your doorstep. Are you a bridge builder? Or are you a bridge destroyer? Our brothers that cannot see eye to eye because of you. And if that is the case, there is a place for you at the altar. Amen. Folks, we are, it's late. If I'm given time to speak to you, I had better become sincere. Because we are about to go. And we don't want anything to hinder the church. We don't want anything to hinder the bride. If it's my bride, let me let go of my pride. If it is my complex, let me let go of my complex. Are you still with me this morning? He's always positive. He's a different person. Peter was a good brother. He always had interesting questions for the Lord. He said, Lord, if my brother wrongs me, how many times must I forgive? You know, in the message we are, we are, we, these days, we try so much to master algebra, but we fail on ABC. I, I could come this morning and speak on seven thunders. I could come and speak about the opening of the way. I could come and speak about the third pole. But what use is it when we've got unforgiving spirit? Here it is a man in our generation because William Branham was the best template of to be a Christian in our generation. Until his son said, you know what? I, didn't even, I couldn't even tell a difference between my father's enemies and my father's friends. Because why? The attitude was the same. But us, our children know our enemies. They have even joined us in our hatred. What are we teaching them? You are not here 10 years down the line. You are going to be with the Lord. What are you leaving behind? Are you still with me? This message that God has given us is the answer to every situation. And, and we are not going to fold our arms and look helpless as the devil goes on the rampage. We've got an answer. And I say, we can stop the devil in his tracks. And we know who we are. We are the bride of Jesus Christ. Our conduct is different. Our attitude is different. Our character is different. Are you with me? Amen. Then the Lord answers Peter. He says, but he, in Luke 12, verse 48, he says, but he that knew not and did commit things with of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. You know, sometimes don't allow the devil to drag you down to lower levels. I'm a minister. I guess if you were to ever hear that Brother Madiba beat up a drunk man, the first question would be, where did he find a, a drunk man? You're not going to be interested in a drunk man. You're going to be interested in Brother Madiba because he's a minister. How did he come to the level at which he had physical altercation with a drunk man? 
Because why? You expect that of a drunk man, but you don't expect that of brother Madi. Am I correct? So I'm simply saying, never ever let the devil drop your altitude as a believer. There are, there are certain levels where as a believer, you must never be found at. Because why? You are an eagle. You see far. And you can go higher. You can go higher, ish, other higher than issues. You can go higher than circumstances. You know, every time when somebody wants to offend me or wants to wrong me, and I see they do it deliberately, I don't react to that. I go higher. And have you realized when you ignore the devil, he becomes powerless? There are certain demons that must be ignored. And we carry on on the Christian journey. We worship God. We preach the message. We believe the message. We testify to the unbelievers. We don't get distracted by what the devil is doing. Certain things are sideshows. Our main focus is the rapture. I hope we are together. He says, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask more. Now, bring this other one, my brother. There can never be reconciliation without forgiveness. Let me show you. I was counseling a couple some time back and the husband had come to a realization that he was addicted to pornography. I know the devil would want, we don't want us to speak about this because the devil hates to be exposed. Mar young people, marriage is not a remedy to last. If you get married without the Holy Ghost and you still have lust, it will fuel it. The answer is the Holy Ghost. Now, when I sat down with the couple, because sometimes when you are a, a minister, you must find the cause in order to find the solution. Now, superficially, you could look at it and say, okay, maybe this man, he's got this problem because it's last. But something told me that it's not last, it's, it's deeper than that. Then I wanted to know how he grew up. I realized that he grew up without a father. I realized that he had so much resentment towards the absence of the father in his life. And that unforgiveness has opened up an avenue where the devil was attacking him. What is happening? His problem was not the pornography. His problem was that he was looking for validation. He has never heard somebody say, you are so good. I'm proud of you. I love you. I support you. Now he is looking for validation. And the devil will always offer a substitute. And the devil's substitute will always be destructive. Folks, I know what I'm talking about. Almost 45% of homes in South Africa are, are without a male figure. Young men are growing without fathers. And what's happening? They've got anger that is growing, that is brewing within them. They don't know how to be a man. They have never been guided on how to be a man. And now, what is happening? They are not even immune when they come into the faith. That's why when we are here as men that are filled with the Holy Ghost, we must be father figures. Amen. Because some of the people, the closest thing that they can see to a father is you in church. Are you still with me? Now, there can never be reconciliation without forgiveness. Even you, you could not be reconciled back to God unless there was forgiveness. First, you had to approach God and say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. God, forgive me what I've done. And that, that forgiveness led to reconciliation. And reconciliation led to redemption. So there's never redemption without forgiveness. I hope we are together. Let's look into a few examples. The prophet is preaching. In the service as I'm preaching, there's a couple in the front. They're busy kissing each other. And Brother Brenham says, I told them, I say, young man, 
Stop what you are doing. If you want to carry on with what you are doing, you had much better excuse yourself and go out. But he said they ignored me and they kept on kissing each other and behaving immorally while the sermon was going on. And the brother Bram says, right there, I had something in my heart and said, just say the word, it will be so. He said, right there, if I could have said blindness, blindness would have come upon them. Let me read it here. He says, something said, say blindness, it will be blind. Say death, they will peg them out. Say what you will. He said, I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. He just left. I said, oh God, what must I do? I turned and he stood there and his face white looking at me. I thought, what must I say? Then I turned and looked like, before I know what I would say, I had said, I said, I forgive you of your act. But I'm going to say, it must have been just the right thing to say. Hang on, folks. If it were many of us ministers and people are behaving like, we would have demonstrated to the people that, look, God is on my side. You die right now, and you want the rest of the people. But that is not the attitude of Christ. Amen. Are you still with me? And I'm going to show you why Brother Branham opted to forgive them. There is a reason why he said, I forgive you. Brother Bunker is all. He says, I didn't sleep. But that was a trap set that Satan would get me all worked up and then make me say the wrong thing. How many times the devil has set traps for us so that we get worked up and we end up acting out of character? He says, but the Holy Spirit was there. And told me beforehand to be careful what I said. Now I want to follow up with that. Why did William Branham say, I forgive you? In Revelation series 232, the prophet says the first throne was in heaven. Judgment seat. The second throne was in Christ. The third throne is in a man. Are you still with me? Yes. Now, he carries on. I want to follow it up with 303. He said, now the mercy seat, now the mercy seat is in the heart. Hallelujah. The same mercy seat that was in heaven was in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, Brother Brenham said, it is in the human heart. So it was not William Brenham forgiving them. It was Christ in William Brenham forgiving them. Yes. Look at Moses. He led an exodus, two million people, and most of them were just murmuring. Every day, they, they, they had no sense of gratitude. They complain about this, it gets resolved, they move to the next complaint. Until God said to Moses, separate yourself. But Moses said, Lord, you cannot destroy them. You are the one that brought them out of Egypt. If you destroy them, your reputation is at stake. Rather than destroying them, you rather blot my name out of your book. Brother Bram said later, I found out it was not Moses. It was the spirit of Christ in Moses. And today, that same message seed that was in the Lord Jesus Christ is in the human heart. It's in your heart. You forgive not because you are weak. You forgive not because you are foolish. You forgive because you are strong. You forgive because why? You have become God's residency. Amen. The mercy seat is in your human heart. Amen. You are able to say, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Amen. Oh God, may you restore the spirit of forgiveness Amen. in families. Amen. May you restore the spirit of forgiveness in assemblies. Amen. May you restore the spirit of forgiveness in the, in the message community. Amen. I think it was brother... Perry Green, he had been driving with Brother Brenham for quite some time. And Brother Brenham had been telling him about how the two tape boys, how they slashed up the tape and made him to say things that he never said. And Brother Brenham was there, who was busy telling him how they wronged him. But after a while, when they got somewhere, Brother Brenham came out of the car, he stretched himself and said, Brother Perry Green, let's go up there and visit the tape boys. 
And Brother Peregrine said, hang on, Brother Peregrine. You just told me for almost three hours how bad they were, how they mistreated you. And Brother Peregrine said, Brother Bram looked at him and said, Brother Peregrine, you must know me better. The fact that they mistreated me doesn't make me love them less. Am I preaching to somebody this morning? This was our prophet. This was our example. May we take the same example and apply it in our lives. Rise above your ill feelings. Rise above your complex. Rise above your head. Yes, it's, it was hurtful, but we want to set you free. Because that hurt, if it lingers longer in you, it will cause cancer. But here, through the preaching of the way, we are administering a healing. Amen. Now, the messy seed is in the heart. See it, well, the shining forth, his glory in all of his children, the Shekinah glory in the human heart. Exodus 32. I think I've spoken about this. And Moses said, he, Yet not, if thou wilt forgive their sin, if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of their book which thou hast written. And Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, Luke 23, verse 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's exactly how we need to be. Same message. Revelation chapter 4, 272. Brother Brum says, but when Christ comes in, you have created an altar on your heart. And your sins are taken daily. From where? From the altar. Where's that altar? In your heart. Now if your sins are taken daily from the altar that is in your heart, May your brother's sins be taken as well. May you be there and stand in the gap for them and say, Father, forgive him. Over the years, as a minister, there's been times where I've said sorry to people even when I was not sorry. Even when, even when, even when, uh, the, when I was not wrong, rather. This, the devil hijacked my tongue. There were times when I said sorry, even when I was not wrong. And I knew I was not wrong. But I said sorry. You know why? I realized that this soul is so important than me being right. My brother's soul is so important. My sister's soul is so important than for me to be right. What use is it for me to be right and for them to miss heaven? I said, brother... The Russians shall die for the unrushers. I'm sorry. And you know what happens most of the time when you say that? The very people that turn around and say, even us, we are sorry. Because what's happening? Forgiveness is contagious. And I say, may it be contagious here. May it be contagious in our assemblies. May it be contagious in our families. Come on, uh, 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 parents. There is, a, there is a wrong thing that parents normally do. When they have wrong to their children, all they do is buy McDonald's. That's a wrong spirit. I say that's a wrong. You are teaching your children that no, you never say I'm sorry. As long as you've got a means to buy a gift, that's it. But buy a gift, but behind the gift, there is something that is important. My child, I should have spoken this way. Daddy is sorry. Then Junior later on is in his house. He knows that when you are a man, you are able to say, I'm sorry. Amen. There are many people that cannot say, I'm sorry, towards one another because they've never heard their parents say, I'm sorry. Amen. If you wrong your partner and you fly to Paris, even when you are in Paris, the offense remains. Yeah. Until you are able to say, I'm sorry. Sometimes, saying I'm sorry will save your budget. Sometimes you don't need to get to Paris. You just need to swallow your pride. Amen. 
he says, the great St. Paul, he said, I die daily. Meaning, I repent daily. Brother Brenham, in one message, I think it's in this message, what dost thou hear, Elijah? He says, repentance blinds the eye of a church member. He says, a church member feels that he's got nothing to repent of. Brother Brenham says, in that message, he says, if you ever get to a point where you think you've got nothing to repent of, he says, you are in a worse condition than a sinner in the streets. We have come here this morning to look into the mirror of the way. And if things are not right, we adjust to them. Am I correct? Folks, if you come to the service and you go back home and you come to the service and there is no change, you are wasting your time. Even, even as I'm ministering to you, I'm ministering to myself. If I live here, I'm going to listen to what was best. And where I need to repent, I say, Lord, there you were not speaking to them. You were speaking to me. I repent. Amen. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Brother Brenham, he speaks in the Fisher home. Paragraph 89. He, he takes a boat. He says, here is a human heart, and I've got a diagram that I will show after. He says, I'm long ways from being an artist. Here is a human heart. Here is a human heart. He says, this one over here has a snake in it. That's sin. Here he has his life. This one over here has a dove in it, which is the Holy Spirit. Here he has a life. Well, this one over here has malice, hatred, envy. What's causing it is this fellow, the snake in the heart. Well, this one over here has love, joy, long-suffering. That's what he does down here. Brother, bring the diagram. We live during the time of the visuals. Before you were born again, Brother Brown makes an illustration there was a snake in your heart. And it says, your malice, your hatred, your indifference, all emanated from the influence of this fellow in the heart. This fellow in the heart, you cannot put him through psychological counseling. You've got to be born again. Yeah. And once you are born again and God fills you with his spirit, it kills the other guy. Then the dove comes in then the nature is not the nature of the serpent anymore. It's now the nature of dove. Amen. What does it mean? Long-suffering. What does it mean? Ability to bear with one another. And folks, as long as the rapture tarries, we're still going to wrong one another. Amen. I told somebody that was coming to our assembly for the first time, I said, if you think you're coming to an assembly of angels, it's wrong. Here we are just human beings trying the best that we can be under God's grace, to better ourselves day in and day out. Why? I'm trying to make him that you don't think that you walk in and it's just a bunch of angels. No, we are a work in progress. Are we together? You are not who you used to be. Certain things 10 years ago that would have made you lose your mind, they don't make you lose your mind anymore. Because why? You are growing. And I said, Lord, help us to grow. Amen. And if you're battling with the same demons year in, year out, you're not growing. Amen. Actually, the devil is undermining you. David never fought the, the lion all the time. He overcame the lion, there came the bear. He never fought the bear all the time. He overcame the bear, there came Goliath. Every time, you must have new challenges. Amen. You can't keep on say, fighting the same demons. No, overcome the demons. Amen. Until the devil knows that you demons, you are demoted because he overcame you. Amen. Are you here, young people? Amen. The nature of the dove. It comes into your heart. You speak peace. 
And you know what is in your heart create an atmosphere around you? Brother Bram says there are people that are great. We appreciate them, love them. But you can't spend much because of the atmosphere that they create. And there are people that once you walk into their atmosphere, even when the devil has fought you hard and things are tough, you just feel everything is going to be right. What's happening? What's the difference? What creates an atmosphere around them? And here is my question. What atmosphere do you carry when you move around? Uh, uh, am I... Some people, when they call you and you see the number, just say, ah, hang on. It's going to make me sick. Am I correct, folks? But some, when they call you, you say, what testimony do they have? What have they read from the message? And they say, brother, I saw something that the prophet spoke about. Go and read it. And they inspire you. May we be such believers. The church will go far. We've got majority of such believers. Where you as an elderly sister, young sisters come around you, they can't wait to hear your testimony. Why? You tell them, we have been through this, we have been through that, and I've seen God's grace. You inspire them. Why do you inspire them? It's because... Right. <laughs> That's not what I'm looking for. But you need somebody, as soon as you tell them that, look, you know, the doctor said I've got this and that, and that person said, hang on. Do you know? And we came together as a church and we prayed. And that's why she's there. Go and speak to her. She was going to give you a testimony. And what's happening? The person's faith gets lifted up. I say, may we lift up faith. Yeah. In the church age, in families coming to do the body viewing, and one thing that breaks my heart most of the time is when you see one family member crying, being hysterical, and you realize the hurt is not because the person has passed away, it's because they still have unresolved issues with the person that is in the box. And you see, had they known that they don't have much time, they would have sat down and said, look, let's talk about it. I forgive you. But what happened? Pride took a hold of them. But now it's too late. That's why I say even in families, let's say I'm sorry. Amen. Sister Hope was taken up. She had to come back and fix something. It seemed minor, but at that moment, it was major. The only thing, the matter, get all these little differences away from you. Little isms, little funny feelings around you for brethren. I said to my church, I say, before the devil destroys a person, he first isolates you. Over the years, if there is one thing that I always constantly put, put it on my radar, and I want to overcome it at all times, it's complex. It's easy to develop a complex. Brother Brennan battled with complex. And in one message, I think he was speaking about Brother Way. And he said, Brother Way has got a complex. And Brother Way, who was a deacon at Branham Tabernacle, he dropped dead in the service. And they had to pray for him. And Brother Branham mentions it later in the second service. He said, when I mentioned that Brother Way has got a complex, it really hit him hard until he had a heart attack. It's easy to develop a complex. But I say it's even better to overcome a complex. And how do you overcome a complex? Act contrary. And if you've got ill feelings towards somebody, I have never seen anyone going into the presence of God and pray for somebody and they walk out still being angry with them. 
When you are angry with somebody, you avoid to pray for them. You know why? Because you want to own this feeling. But when you come there and say, Lord, as you forgave me, forgive my brother. As you forgave me, forgive my sister. She said this, but I don't think it was her. It is the devil that twisted her words. Oh God, may there be no hard feelings towards me, towards them. Right there, you feel healing coming over you. He says, don't let no root of bitterness ever get into your soul. <laughs> you know, Brother Danny, during COVID, is this a sanitizer? Everybody knew about a sanitizer. Because it was a time where everybody was obsessed about hygiene. If you touch somewhere, you wanted to quickly either sanitize or wash your hands. And everybody was obsessed. And I said, Lord... As much as we are obsessed about hygiene of the body, may we be obsessed about the hygiene of the soul. Yes. And unforgiveness contaminates the soul. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. And what's the best sanitizer? The word of God. Yes. I forgive him. He says, don't let no root of bitterness ever get into your soul. If you do, it will canker you. Keep love. I don't care how much people hate you. And let me promise you, they're still going to hate you. Amen. For no reason. Amen. And God will allow them to hate you. Amen. And let me take it away. He will allow them to mistreat you. Because he wants to check what material you are made of. Amen. And if you are God's material... You are not going to be changed by circumstances. You are not going to be changed by attitudes. You will be a son of God and a daughter of God, irrespective of the circumstances. Amen. Until people see you that have mistreated you, you still smile at them. When you meet their children, you tell them, greet mommy and tell mommy that I miss her. And they wonder what is happening. It's not because you are special. You are a believer. Amen. I don't care how much people hate you. Have you realized it's very easy to love people that love you? It's very good. It's very easy to love people that speak good about you. It's very easy to visit people that really speak good about you. But as Christians, let's go to those that speak bad about us. And I'm not preaching what the devil has not tested me on. There was uh, some time back, I was sitting, there's a, a minister. I disagreed with him on doctrine. And over the years, the devil kept on speaking in my mind, you know, say, yeah, you hate him. And I kept on saying to the devil, I don't hate him. I just disagree. And the devil said, yeah, you hate him. One day I said, devil, I'm going to show you. I phoned the minister. I said, are you available at your house? He said, yeah, I'm available. I said, I'm coming over for coffee. And when I got there, I didn't speak about anything that we disagree on. I was saying, I was just thinking about you. And I mentioned the good times. When I left there, I said, devil, can you say again that I hate him? <laughs> the devil was quiet. That's how we overcome the devil. <laughs> Brahman says, I don't care how much people hate you. You love them anyhow. If you can't do that, You're unsealed. You're going to lose place yet. So come on back and get that sealed up right good with the blood of Christ. Amen. It will cleanse you from all roots of bitterness. He comes in church order. Paragraph 9. says, and remember, God is looking to me to see I stay in the way. I'm looking to you to see that you carry the, out the way. See, in this church, keep it spiritual. 
For remember, all the forces of the dark kingdom of Satan will be turned against you as you begin to grow in the Lord. You must be soldiers, not just fresh recruits. A fresh recruit lacks experience. Zeal without experience is disaster. Now, you are eight soldiers now and being trained to fight. Satan will come among you, cause you to dispute one another if he can. Turn him down just immediately. I don't know how many say we need to turn down the devil. I'm not only speaking to this church, I'm speaking to my church. I'm speaking to everybody within the message. Let's turn down the devil. He wants, he, he's a specialist of hatred. Let's turn down hatred. You know, Brother Branham says in the millennium, he says Satan will still be there, but he won't do anything because he will be bound by a chain of circumstances. You know what it means? Brother Branham says all the people that will be there would have overcome him. He's got no one to use. I said, Lord, may you make us to taste millennium and have a foretaste of it right now where the devil has got no one that he can use. When he comes to you and say, that brother, you say, devil, shut down. That sister said, devil, no, no, not me. Amen. What's happening? He will be bound by a chain of circumstances. But how many times the devil makes us to be worked up? Amen. You are brethren. You know, Brother Danny, as I come to close, when we get on the other side after the rapture, a carnal mind thinks that we're going to be looking. Oh, Brother Danny, so he's so, not here. I knew it. <laughs> if you've got such attitude, you're not going. I can guarantee you, you're not going. When we get there, where's Brother Danny? He's here. God bless you. Where is brother, you know, he's here. God bless you. Where is brother Robert? He's here. God bless you. Where is so and so? Are you still with me? Hugging one another. And our desire starts here. Brother, I want to meet you there. Sister, I want to meet you there. No matter what happens between us, I don't want you to miss your spot on the Rapture Express. And what am I going to do? I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to fight with you. I'm going to forgive you if it is necessary. Amen. Oh God, help us. Amen. That we realize who we are. Amen. Brother says the day the bride recognizes who she is, the rapture will go. Amen. What is hindering the rapture? We don't recognize who we are. We still behave like children. We are not new recruits. We are trained soldiers. We are to hold a standard in this evening line when the world is darkened and the whole church kingdom is going into the world council of churches. Let me close here and then we'll continue in the second service. I'm still here. God bless you. God bless you, brother Danny. God bless you. I'm sure everyone enjoyed that this morning. I had a smile. My face is actually sore from just smiling and enjoying the word of God this morning. God bless you, brother. My, that was so in time and how we just so appreciate the word of God this morning. I love your, clo your closing statement on the Rapture Express, brother. <laughs> yes, that's where we are. We are on that train going to that side. Oh, my. We've got a baptism this morning. Uh, the brother that wants to be baptized if you can just come to the front and maybe there's somebody else this morning that says Lord I want to take that step why don't you come this morning oh my wonderful to see our young brother come anybody else there's water what hindereth let's all stand this morning I would like for us to sing one or two songs and uh, oh my 
just so wonderful to be in the house of God this morning. Can we sing that song? It's heavy on my heart now. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. You know, the brother had a slide up there where he showed forgiveness, brings reconciliation, and then that leads to redemption. So let's sing that song this morning. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim that. Amen. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim.
Wednesday at Easter, at Easter uh, I've heard what the, minister, the preacher said. Brother Wilton, help me out. I keep listening. That. Let's sing that song. you young brother let's close our eyes in a word of prayer heavenly father lord that same remedy of god is applied today father lord when they stood there that day and they turned to peter and said what shall we do he said well <coughs> there's water repent be baptized in the name of the lord jesus christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And yes, our brother, this morning, oh God, taking this step in faith, oh God, we just pray that you'll just bless him, oh Lord, and may the Holy Ghost, oh God, just come so near him and, and fill him, oh Lord. And oh God, that even his parents will see that here is a life changed, oh God. We pray for him, Lord, and we pray, oh God, that you will go from this place, Lord, rejoicing, oh God, and Father, knowing, Lord, that you are with him. Oh God, as the devil will come from each and every angle, Lord, you are greater, Lord. You have raised a standard in this day, oh God, and we thank you for it. Bless our brother now, Father, as we commit him to you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I mean, you may be seated.